Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, as you probably know by now, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we need to read about the vast judgment. All of them? Asked one of the officers on the prosecution team. Yes, all of them affirm the lead prosecutor. Most of these people are on the list are MPs that haven't been involved in anything too terrible. Sure, they may have voted on a few suspicious things, but that's not entirely criminal or worthy of serious punishments, aside from kicking them out of the House of Commons. That doesn't mean we can just kill them all, of course. Sure we can, said one of the Sterling Align officers. Another officer was taken aback by the statement. No, we can't. If we do this, we will be in a massive orgy of violence. Besides, the peace people aren't going to have any future in politics after this. Who wants an old holdover from the royal party days? You are quite correct, said the main prosecutor. We need to make the transition as painless as possible, and that means we can't slaughter anyone who disagrees with us. These people have terrible views and beliefs, but that doesn't mean we should kill them or make them suffer untoward punishment. Now, let's go over the people we're letting off one last time and make the final decisions. Yes, sir, said an attorney as he began to read. First up is Thatcher. Margaret. Any objections to keeping her on the list? There weren't any. <laughs> All right, so that's her case settled. I'll get her defense No, She's free to go. Next, we've got Save the Bullets for the Important People. The Punished General. Hit by the cold wind of southern England, Bernard Montgomery started to cough uncontrollably. The cloudy day didn't help matters either, with rain seeming inevitable. However, the sentence was very clear. Forced labor. It was the alternative to a firing squad, but Montgomery would have preferred that then to be humiliated like this. His first job was pretty straightforward, digging holes to install electrical wires. Joining his former comrades in arms in the task, he will have to expiate the sins with the sweat of his brow, at least that was what he thought. So, despite his old age, he was still able to eavesdrop on the conversation between the two guards supervising the interns. Are you sure that we can put him to work? He doesn't seem like he could take that too much. This, uh, <clears throat> this dude needs to pay for his betrayal. Besides, he's not going to dig. We need someone to put the wires in. Orders from above. Seems reasonable. We don't want that old fart to drop dead. Furious at this insolence, Montgomery grabbed the shovel and started to dig with his fellow inmates. The stunned guards witnessed the angry old general shoveling dirt and getting increasingly more agitated. What the heck are you looking at? Tell Claude to grab his pit and shove it. I'll die working here if it's necessary. Work will set you free. In the trial of the generals, the military officers piled in the room, the stiff posture, and the confident strides denoting the years of experience. The pack was led by none other than Field Marshal Gerald Templar, who had arrived to, uh, to arrange to deliver his own speech in their proceedings. Each and every defendant was accused of high treason, and each and every member pleaded not guilty. The defense emphasized the men's service records, appealing to their status as honorable war veterans. Templar echoed such sentiments himself, drawing strict contrast between his generals and the likes of Chesterton. While the fascists were serving their own ta uh, t talented or twisted ambitions, he claimed, the generals were serving their families, their wives and children, and grandchildren, who those would have been slaughtered had any of them dared join forces with Himmler. The prosecution directed the conversation away from the men's service records and towards their actions during many years of collaboration, citing Claude Auchinleck as an example they should have aspired to instead of fighting against. Once more, the jury's divided. Supporters of the SLP and Sterling alike follow the line of demanding death for all traitors, while followers of Claude and NDL argue in favor of honorable discharge. Send them out of the country... Oh, actually, so SLP's progress will increase. Send them before a firing line for the movement in support of the army. And send them out of the military, the NDL. Well, I'd like to do that one to get Jellicoe. Like you saw on the thumbnail, we're going with a bit of a guy named Harold here. So I'll send him out of the country. Make a political party, too. That's pretty nice. Well, that immediately changed stuff here. A vindication of purpose. And yes, there is quite a few events to read in the beginning of this episode. The Otful Dodger was not the fanciest of pubs, and certainly its current clientele were anything but the models of English high society. Seated around a number of tables near the back of the pub were some five dozen men, and perhaps half as many women, to one grizzled and wet from braving rains for the occasion. Some bore little red sashes on their arms, a few wore old uniforms from wars past, an odd little mix of commies and a few ideologies besides. Finally, at precisely 7 p.m., they all toasted their drinks, the comrades lost and friends wound, to ideals and men executed for the part in the event so many years ago. Similar gatherings of London Uprising veterans were occurring across England, though outside the official event was probably the largest group of actual participants in London. The Germans hadn't been inclined to be merciful after all. Mostly the men and women sitting at the back of the pub remembered the ideals and hopes which had led them to this moment of Pollitt's speech the night before it began, and other smiles of men long gone. It was suspected that only a scant 3,000 of the 10,000 strong force had actually escaped the Germans corralling the fighters into the cable street. Each of the men and women uh, toasting fallen comrades was among those quick, strong, or lucky enough to avoid that charnel house. Perhaps it wasn't surprising then that London Uprising was not something remembered fondly by those who fought in it, but as a group of men and women exited the pub to head or to, to head their separate ways into free England, they could finally feel like the sacrifices there were worth it. 
They died for an ideal. Let us uh, live to honor them. And we are done with the focuses, or at least events. Right now we're doing uh, the reformers, which I believe I read yesterday. But if you'd like to read again, please go ahead. And the liberal. Reginald Maudling, by the accounts of those who knew him, he should not have joined the collaborations at all. One of the most prominent voices against the government while in parliament. Many of similar beliefs joined Hamilton when the war broke out. Yet he betrayed them all and stayed with the collabs. Now he is brought before us to defend his decision. This is easily the most controversial of the defendants we tried, however. Aside from the aforementioned break with his colleagues, and friends, he hasn't done anything particularly interesting after that. Some still want to punish him. Others argue that what he did does not warrant him being brought before a court for murders and traitors at all. Let us see the evidence before we make a final decision. The flight of the traitors. While well, the plane started to slowly land, ch officers chatted about their long trajectories, discussing antidotes about their military careers, remembering funny stories that probably never happened, laughing at jokes as old as England itself. Being expelled from their homeland wasn't easy to digest, but the camaraderie of years fighting together made it more pleasant. Some may even engage in political talks about the future of the country, democracy, socialism. What was next? Questions framed carefully, of course, without arousing the wrath of his captors. A bunch of them suddenly started to grab their bags and suitcases and walk towards the exit. Their ride was at ready. The remaining officers respectfully made their military salute to salute their colleagues. Field Marshal Templar saw the plane rising in the sky, thinking about what he would do once he arrived. He reconsidered to create a military museum and collect antiques of the war. It was hurtful, but someone needed to keep the past alive. This missed. The trial of Harold Macmillan. Actually, we could probably cut this down from here on out. Macmillan was always going to be a controversial case. For many years, he was uh, he headed the reformist faction within the royal party and had at least somewhat pushed for partial reform but when the war came he ended up in the cabinet of douglas home and anyone in the cabinet ended up at oxford even if they were primarily dealing with his majesty's treasury <clears throat> Things took a strange turn, as at the opening of the trial, Macmillan stood up and read a prepared statement. In it, he told the jury that he had joined the collaborators out of a desire to stop the suffering of English citizens back in the war, and that he attempted to subvert the will of the Germans at every turn he could. His goal had been to see a return to English democracy, however. He had decided to remain in the royal party during the war out of a fear the rebellion would be unsuccessful, and because of a fear that the garrison of Cornwall would put an end to organized resistance along with Germany. It was only after the war had ended, with a free government restored, the garrison crushed and Germany still chaos did he realize the enormity of his mistake. He accepted the responsibility of his actions and apologized. This threw the trial in a uh, tailspin. The defense argued that Macmillan was sincere about his regret for an enormous mistake done with the best of intentions. The prosecution argued it was not enough and merely a last ditch attempt to save his life. The jury was divided as well. The NDL oriented ones argued that he should be exiled, while the Sterlinger, Sterlingerites wanted him dead for his actions. The leftists were more merciful, however. They wished to see him experience a new England taking shape at first handedly. Removed from any of its politics, of course. Removed from the scene entirely. One bullet, back of the head, clap clap. <laughs> Removing him from politics is good enough. I think that's the way we go. Oh, we lose political power. Well, we got political power from the other ones. And actually, I was letting time go on so we can do some more of this stuff. We're, we're catching up in Cornwall. That's pretty nice. Um, over here, it's too far away. 40, 36, 42. That's pretty good. We're looking, I would say, as some might say, quite bueno. Um, yeah, Cornwall. Awesome. And actually, see over here, um, we're somewhat efficient here. It's going to drop down to 65%, which is very disappointing. But uh, well, I wanted to make sure we didn't have lowered government stability, really. And this is going down too, but it's really not going down by that much. So we have got time for this. Hopefully. The gavel strikes. It is done. The Oxford trials have concluded, and now we merely wait the sentence. Throughout these trials, we've seen the very worst the collaborationist government and its military dogs had to offer. We've heard tell of countless crimes and even more horrific going on in the dark underbelly of the collaborationist regime. But the sentence shall apportion guilty on those deserving. Our actions beforehand could well have affected the outcome significantly. We can only hope that the international community sees the trials as just, or at least fair, if not. We may have made a miscalculation. The family business, after movingly, carefully removing the paper from the typewriter, Harold Macmillan added it to the immense pile on his desk. While being forced out of politics was frustrating, he didn't feel completely discouraging. Besides, he probably would have retired in a few years without accomplishing anything of worth. On the other hand, his new business, while technically his old job, offered better opportunities to succeed. Not only in monetary terms, but also to save his good name, thanks to the resources of his editorial house. He would publish his memoirs, telling his version of the events. The ambitious autobiography aimed to emphasize his role as a reformist that wanted to save the rotting government, debunking the smears from mediocre politicians. With his information re reaching the public, they won't be able to label him a fascist stooge anymore. Macmillan admired once again the portrait of his ancestor Daniel hanged in the wall, or on the wall. The life accomplishments from him and his descents weren't going to be undone by the bitter rebel disdain for their rivals. Publishing books all over England has been the family tradition for generations, and he's going to make sure to respect that sacred legacy. History is written by the victors, of course. 
and the trial and original Malding, he was hauled before the court next. He was mostly known as an MP, was pretty friendly with the reformist cause, many thought that he would be a sure defector to Himmler, who were dismayed that he did not. Now that he was in hauled in front of Oxford to answer for his betrayal. He entered the plea of not guilty. That was the only normal thing about his trial. It turns out that it was scant evidence that he did anything really wrong, or what was already committed by thousands of other collaborators who were already uh, <clears throat> walking free at the streets at the moment. The prosecution argued that he was responsible for at least some of the decisions made by the government, while his defense painted the trial as a political vendetta against a man with a decent history of anti-authoritarian actions. This led to a hung jury again. Cloud supporters thought uh, he shouldn't be given anything more than a slap on the wrists. Bill supporters still wanted him banned from the political scene, and of course David supporters were initially wanting him dead too, but eventually lowered their proposal to exile once the rest of the jury deemed it ludicrous. Slap him with whatever, he'll be pardoned anyway, slap him in the face. Forcible and permanent relocation to an area we can think of. Or he can be a scummy traitor in another profession. Yes. Hey look, we just converted Cornwall. Love it. Not bad, not bad. Looking pretty socialist if you ask me. It's not worth very much, but it's still 14 seats. Ah, citizenship were born. One man, one vote. Though now that women can vote as well, the might saying might need to be updated somewhat. One person, one vote doesn't quite run off the tongue so well either way. The National Democratic League and the Socialist Labour Party are now prepared to face off in the first democratic election held on English soil in two decades. At stake is the future of the monarchy, the economy, and the reconstruction process, as well as the assorted reforms each party says that will or will not enact. But it shan't be some shady council of military men who decide how this happens. It shall be the people. And people alone, this is what we fought for, a free and independent England. Let us enjoy it whilst we can. We lose some political power, get more monthly population, academic and industrial, uh, uh, social stuff goes up. Words are hard, even though I just said a whole bunch of them. Oh, a business as usual. The morning sun streaming through the window at least made the job at the company less depressing. After drinking another glass of whiskey, Reginald Marlin continued to check the financial reports from his desk. Being forbidden to hold a political position ever again was a huge blow to him. He felt like he didn't do anything particularly wrong, but the rebels disliked him for some reason. The disgraced politician liked to think it was because he could, uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, because he could be a future threat to the new order, despite all the talk about freedom and democracy. Well, Himmler was no different than them when, it, with it, came to running the show. Distracted for a moment and his frustrated political aspirations, Modeling noticed that some of the numbers didn't add up. It looked like someone was withholding money that wasn't theirs. Whatever, Modeling thought to himself, passing the page. He would figure that out later, who it was, and maybe teach the poor dude how to embezzle the money better, after all. It wasn't his problem, right? Looking at the bottle once again, Modeling grabbed it and swallowed the entire content in one gulp. Bad habits never die. Drink, drink. When in doubt, we drink heavily. Well, maybe not everyone here, but some of us, maybe. All right, my friends. A lot of PP. Claude Rock and Luck, you've been a good leader for now, but I have a feeling it's going to go a bit left here. Oh. Well, Hadrish has outlived Speer. Ah, uh, no getting for this time. Or dang it, Speer. Keep fighting over there. Waiting for this, too. Um, the decision of a free people. Months of advertisements, speeches and rallies, debates and arguments and insults. Shouting a heated discussion. And now it all comes down to this. The choice of the people of England. Both parties have been battling hard to ensure the victory at the polls. Could they have done more? Perhaps some missteps have been, could have been avoided. Could this campaign have been conducted more positively? Perhaps. But both campaigns have done whatever they could do to ensure victory in the coming elections. Nothing less than the very future of the country is at stake. After their ballots are cast, the people of England scurry home to turn on the TVs and radios to see who the winner is. Many have predictions, many have biases and hopes, just like me. Others have hopes and polls and samples behind their thinking. But there's only one way to know for sure what has happened, and that is to count the votes. Well, usually, that's what, how usually, you know, some democratic things run, counting votes. And then the Socialist Labour Party w wins the elections. Who saw that coming? I didn't. I totally didn't, especially, especially the guy on the thumbnail didn't. But the victory of the Socialist Labour Party. The first election in England after the war, and the first truly won free since 1935, would be obviously be a momentous one. After years of hardship and deprivation, the people of England would have their say and the world waited with bated breath, wondering which option the people would choose. Would it be the new reactionary government of Sterling or Jellicoe's coalition of conservatives and milquetoast liberals? But this was a revolution, and the people chose a revolutionary party, Bill Alexander's two heirs, the Communist Socialist Labour Party, the final iteration of the pre-war Labour Party, and the Communist Party of Great Britain. The political arm of the left resistance, and an organization determined to do away with the rotting structure of an old England once and for all. This does not mean democracy in England, it is truly dead, of course not. Its leader, Harold Wilson, is a former Labour leader, and who has committed to respecting the democratic process and pursuing a policy of moderating the more extreme policies of the party, but he must be watchful for the hardliners waiting in the wings, willing to strike if given the opportunity. A revolution in its totality. Actually, he was a, uh, what was it, MP, I think, for in England in our own, you know, timeline. I, as a person... An American. I don't know that much about it, but what is this? 
Who leads the SLP and how does reform is a major headache for Wilson. Reformers and hardliners both battle for control of the party. Meanwhile, battles raging to reform the organization from a strictly communist party to one that is more socially democratic and libertarian socialist. Wilson must keep control and reform the party if he's to, if he's to be successful. You know, we, you know we have serious people when they start smoking the pipes. I gotta learn how to do that. But also, if I remember correctly, the hardliner influence... If you go hardliner, there is no content at the time of this recording, so we gotta make sure that we go reformers pretty hard. Uh, sit down with moderate unions. Concessions to hardliners. I like the stability. Harass political opponents. I like harassing people. Commemorate the heroes of the Civil War. That's, pretty, that's probably a pretty smart thing to do. Promises to hardliners. Assurance to moderates. Speak to the nation. Nothing for social development, huh? And we still have the election season, but it's that's already over, so we can close out of that. And let us read The People Have Spoken. Soon after the ashes of the old collaborator government had settled, the first free elections since the end of the Second World War were held in England, and the Socialist Labour Party emerged victorious. Now our ministers must prepare themselves to run a left-wing agenda so radical and ambitious it has never been witnessed before in 10 Downing Street. We have inherited an England devastated and divided by civil war, but we still hope that we may change England's fortunes for the better. Our task is by no means complete. This election victory has only been the first obstacle we have overcome on our way towards securing freedom and equality for all of our people. And you know what? Look at that flag. That is... That's actually really cool. But thank the party. Oh, let's do this one first. Meet with the unions. Trade unions were always the most active and ardent supporters of socialism in this country before the invasion. All of the old union members were the first to feel the fear of Nazi persecution, leading many to believe the unions to be all but dead as a political organization. However, they have yet again proved themselves to be great supporters of a cause, and for that they must be thanked. Besides, these unions will be an intrinsic part of our future plans. Keeping them on side will be the best cause of action we can take. 9. Regent Terrace. The recognition of Scottish independence led to a whole host of things to be decided by England. Who would be the ambassador for starters? What the trade agreements to assign? And where should the embassy go? Edinburgh didn't have a number of embassy buildings like London had, especially since many nations refused to see them as a legitimate government up until recently. They did have a series of former consulates from before the Second World War, and many nations used those to conduct business with the Scottish government. England wanted a bit more than that, however. They wanted something a bit more, b more better, more imposing to get the message to Scotland that they were the top dogs in the relationship. Unfortunately, large, ominous, big buildings were a bit of a rare commodity in Edinburgh at the moment, and many people didn't want to spend money on new structure that might not be completed until uh, Scotland rejoined the UK, so they decided to compromise and purchase a pre-existing structure that was close to Scotland's government. They found what they needed in a building almost next to the old Parliament House in Edinburgh. It looked like an embassy and had space for, for one, and it was close enough to get the message across with an English set-up shop there. It was absolutely perfection. Except for the US Embassy being next door and closer to the Scottish government, but hey, those Americans, always second fiddle to the bloody Yanks, as they should be, the one who never surrendered. The old man knew the audience listening to his address was entranced. That is what he had hoped for. His mind had the occasional fears on the flight from Canada that he was not well respected here. That his beloved country had written him off a miserable failure, but upon landing, the mood was anything but. And as he visited the House of Commons for what he knew was his last time, he knew that this would be his grandest triumph on the side of many great ones. He continued, we lay prostrate, a year, uh, prostrate for a year, and to many countries it seemed that our account was closed and we, that we were finished. All this tradition of ours, arts, history, we were gone and finished and liquidated. Very different is the mood today. England, other nations thought, had drawn a sponge across our slate, but instead of countries stood in the gap, there was no flinching and no thought in giving in, and by what seemed almost a miracle to the outside these isles, though we ourselves never doubted it, we now find the invader with all his treachery and greed lies subdued. For everyone, this is a lesson never give him. His voice raised as he reached the crescendo of the speech. Never, 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 nothing, great or small, petty or large, ever give him, except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. These past months have been catastrophic events throughout the world, but these have been the greatest months our country has ever lived, and we must thank God that we have been allowed to play a part in the making these days memorable in the history of our race. Closing announce, advance, Britannia. Long live the cause of freedom, God save the Queen, and the chamber exploded into a rapturous applause. The old man's legacy is secured. Look at that guy. <laughs> the people's flag is deepest red. Comrades and countrymen, I would like to thank you for the bottom of my heart. Thank you for entrusting the future of our great England to us. I would also like to congratulate the other candidates and the, thank the voters who cast their ballots for them. All of you have affirmed the dedication of the English nation to democracy and the rule of law. You can rest assured that we will fight day and night for the livelihood of all working class toilers and stand firm in defense of liberty. We shall fight, we shall toil and rebuild, and once again we finish our work. England will be free and prosperous once again. Red banners fluttered in the breeze as the air was filled with the sounds of the red flag. The work had begun, a long and arduous it shall be. Hopefully the real Harold Wilson will show up soon. He's still not here. Gosh darn it, but thank the party. This unprecedented turn in English politics would have never been possible without the unity maintained by the Socialist Labour Party during the election. However, Harold Wilson knows all too well that this unity could disappear, and the party could collapse at any moment. Of course, such a disaster must be avoided, and any and all solidarity in the party must be preserved. Wilson will therefore make 
make thanking the party the centerpiece of its coming public engagements. It will be clear to our supporters and rivals alike that the SLP is united and ready to improve the lives of all those who suffered under the past. The fall of the House of Windsor. It was almost inevitable from the day the results came in that England's monarchy would not be long for the world. It had been involved in such turbulence and controversy the past few years, and its future was now uncertain once unthinkable. The new government was required to give its supporters what they had promised, and they promised a republican system of government, where no man was required to swear fealty to some king or queen instead. The rule of law would be held above all else, and the government would derive its power from the people and not through divine right. The opposition was incensed. Many knew the resistance as Her Majesty's most loyal resistance. How could they go back on her like that? Despite the protests and anger on those in the right, it was clear that England would be set on this new path. A thousand years of English monarchy, which had survived turmoil, war, and revolution, was now at an end a victim of the changing times. How does one have a monarchy in a socialist government anyway? Easy! It's called monarchical socialism. Why can't we have that here? Ah, it's less than a billion. It's not too bad. Growth is not great, but we're working on it. So, we're very loyal for now. It's going to drop down 85%. I don't know. I just wanted to get the loyalty as high as I could, which looks pretty good. It's still inefficient here. I mean, it is what it is, but... And I'm not too worried about that. Meet with the unions and thank the party. So, basically, we're just going to focus on this and this a little bit more. Um, Reformation is very low. Rome influence is pretty good right here. Yeah, I, I also, I'm a little, like I said earlier, I'm a little disappointed, uh, low to increase, which is actually really nice, that uh, we do not have anything so, sort of like social program, social, social, a, social program, social development increase for any of those decisions. You think that being a left wing party here, that we could actually, you know, make poverty better, but whatever. A discreet chat. Long before, or since before the election victory of the Socialist Party, Socialist Labour Party. Bill Alexander had been formulating big plans for the future of a socialist England. Now that the party is in power, Alexander is finally able to put all of his plans into action. However, he will have to first talk with the Prime Minister. He expects that the talks to be long and the topics numerous, but he knows that the meeting has far more meaning than just a quite quiet aside. The road to reconstruction is not bad. Um, let's change things around here. Decriminalize same-sex relationships. The House of Lords Act. Oh boy. The female pension. The Equality Act. Well, we're going to thank the party first. What's on this side? Don't split the party. Um, the United Front. Uh, that seems okay. More support will increase. They'll decrease. Spanner at work. Convince hardliners. This stuff seems okay. It doesn't really look like it's going to help us out that much, honestly, right now. Maybe I'm wrong. But, yeah, I think we can wait for this side and strike. The true England, huh? Casting off dead generations of Commonwealth. This seems like we would go to the OFN side. Dealing with exiles, name new ambassadors. That's not bad. Weekly stability and political power for a year. That's actually pretty nice. Financing our reforms. It seems like we probably want to go down that way. Focus on consumer goods. Our natural wealth. Well, it seems like either way we'll go. Um, actually, no. Jellico probably has a unique focus suite different from this one. Probably? I'm not exactly sure, but it seems like it. So, expert of the OFN. Enter American markets. The OFN with us. We need to be in the same faction. Let's change things around here. Moderation when necessary. Some radical appeal. Um, women's pension. Equality. The church. Uh, what's over here? The new armed socialist armed forces. Okay. Actually, we could do that one next if we really wanted to, but we don't really need to. Well, hello! George Wallace was inaugurated when we got libertarian social support on our side. Segregation never to segregation forever. Over a cup of tea. Do you know why I've invited you here, Harold? Bill Alexander spoke as Wilson walked into the room. To tell me what I'm supposed to do and reminisce about the past over a cup of tea? Remember, you promised to tell me about your time in Spain. I'd love to, but you see, we really don't have the luxury of time right now, and spending that the little of what we have remaining or reminiscing about the past would be a criminal waste. Here, take a seat. He nodded towards the free chair on the other side of the table. I'd like to talk with you about the party. Wilson raised his eyebrows. What of it? We won the elections in no small part thanks to you. We've got the motivation and talent to push through and implement our ideals. The traders got their arses kicked and you and Alkin sure made sure of it. It's a grand coalition after all, and maybe even a bit too grand. Exactly. I know that rebuilding England won't be easy and neither will keeping the Germans out, but these problems might not be the worst we've you are about to face. The SOP truly is too grand of a coalition, and I believe it's only a matter of time before Birch makes his move. We have to strike first, hero, and do it fast. You do it too late, you risk uh, a split in the party. You don't do it enough, you might have a couple coup on your hands. I know, Bill said. Bill, I'm not exactly new to this. It looks like left unity will not continue for long. The road to reconstruction. 
For the Socialist Labour Party recently elected has fallen on Prime Minister Wilson to bear the burden of sorting out economic situations England finds herself in. Wilson was elected on a platform of widespread government intervention in the economy and more generally getting England back into shape. What with their economy hamstrung by the economic crisis of the 50s and the recent civil war both? The risk reconstruction will be a long process. But, thanks to the combined support of both our wings and a steady plan to implement our reforms, we are sure closer to ever to reaching our socialist ideal. Whatever came before was a broken world, and upon its ashes, the world built a better one, and a just one, and a fair one. And financing reforms. Unfortunately, England is not a socialist paradise just yet. To reach the goals we have set out for ourselves in the Wilson government, we'll need to gather the necessary funds, something that cannot be covered by OFN aid in our existing industrial infrastructure alone. We need money, and our government has two options on how to get it. The first and probably easiest choice for England is to focus on the basics, raw resources and the exports which are valuable no matter when or to whom you sell them. This will probably sit well with our allies in Washington. The other option is to dispose to turn England into a capitalist world's chief manufacturer of consumer goods. A risky option also gives us a chance to make England more than a pawn for the rest of the world, yet a choice must be made. Crap, I don't know which way. I want to keep the workers fed at least. Small decrease in economic output of jobs, huh? Fund the farms. I don't mind that. Subsidize the fisheries. One, two, three. Um, oh, let's do this one first. The new economy. Two decades of fascist government have led the mark on the English economy. Poverty has become unacceptably common, and the workers and unemployed now alike cry out for a serious change in how the economy functions, fortunately for them. The Socialist Labour Party has come to power, and they have made great efforts to show that they have a plan to fix the many flaws present in England's economy. Their methods may be without precedent, but they are not entirely unfounded. The program they have come up with aims to achieve the goals set out in the Beverage Report, which was published over 20 years ago. The report itself came out a year before the war's end, yet it outlined how Britain's economy would be remodeled if it were to emerge victorious, a situation it na naively believed could be achieved. Its focus was on the need to eradicate poverty from the country, for this to be done, that five giants of want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness must be defeated. Beveridge had requested Wilson to reach or research much of the report, and although the Prime Minister's old mentor may no longer be around to see his work put into reality, he hopes that their work will not be in vain. Beveridge's, uh, Beveridge's uh, vision will be realized, and England's workers will be all the rich for it. A radically different approach. So it's going down to 85%. If we keep boosting it up, um, what if we do that one? So 85% now is up to 90. That's good enough for me. We're just going to slowly increase this. Really, actually, really, really slowly. Uh, efficiency. We're just gonna take that one for now. Um, thirty-two percent. That's not bad. Thirty-two point five. Uh, I keep doing some of that stuff too. Uh, I I don't want to lose stability, so no thanks. Loyalty will actually increase there too. That's actually really good too. Reform progress increased by one percent. Actually, probably gonna do whatever increases our reform progress too. Social reform. Reformers get a ten percent boost. That's not bad. There you go. Hey, more stability. You know what? Why not? And I don't want to do either one of these because I don't want to lower any either side of these. So that's fine with us. Um, accelerate mechanization. I like that one. So consumer goods, industry, industry. Um, all right, Dressler wins. Workers in the factories. I like that. The means of the mass production. Equipment goes up, which is good. Export focus. Medium experience and job growth. All right. Our natural wealth. A new deal for coal. Expand English steel. Efficiency through socialism. Honestly, it's looking like. I like the left side more because it helps improve itself. I like natural wealth. I think I want to go with the left side just because it helps our industrial equipment. I don't see any social improvements here. There's no social improvements. So we got uh, either way. Like I would disappoint people with whether way we were going to go. So we're going to go on focus on consumer goods for now at least. The part of the reality that England must now face is that the fact that we can no longer survive off of the former colony's resources. The socialist labor parties thus turn to more traditional methods of acquiring income. The Americans, it seems, have an ever-increasing market for finished goods, but they don't produce a great amount of some devices themselves due to the expense of making them over the Atlantic outweighing the profits. We don't have that problem. The necessary living wage for English labor is, e is low, even if we increase it threefold, and importing materials and mass is hardly a chore. Thus, the Wilson government proposes a plan under which England shall aim to become invaluable to the OFN, not just through a strategic position, but it is our primary source of consumer goods. We will become the China of this timeline for now. A, a legacy of ink and paper. Irene had, had sold had a solid routine that had kept her sane since the Civil War. After leaving her secretary position to a local unemployment office, she'd ride the creaky, rusted over bus down to that little village up north, one which, unlike Birmingham, seemed relatively unscarred by the years of artillery shells. In the misty, cracked roadway in the town south, she'd enter Everett's bookshop, the quaint building made of dark oak marked only by its bright green name painted above the entrance. Time to look for another volume to spend her nights with once the kids were fed and, of course, tucked in. After a brief greeting and chatting with old Everett, Irena went over
over to the world literature section. She peruses the shelves like a skilled detective, an eye for any title from her native Poland, knowing that anything she found would likely be at least 30 years old. As she ran her fingers through each section of the towering shelf, she fully expected it to come up empty-handed, until reaching a toppled-over collection on the very bottom level. All in nondescript red binding, within these titles were hundreds of pages, pages written in Polish, some so old that she could hardly comprehend half of what, she was being, what was being said. Tales of medieval rebels, supernatural battles, and the daily struggle of family life, all memories of a land she could hardly envision since first arriving on England's shore ten years ago. In an instant, piled up the books and pressed them against her chest, moving carefully over to Everett, calculating in her head to see if she could even afford such a collection with other meager wages. Find everything you need, Everett said, in a nasally, ever amicable tone. Irena replied that, yes, she found exactly what she needed, but about 15 pounds. Sure, no worries, love. This looks about as important to your family as a nightly ration package. It's yours, free of charge. With a smile and a statement of absolute bewilderment appreciation, or bewildered appreciation, Irena helped Everett fill up a large brown bag, then quickly made her way out of the shop and towards the bus stop. On the distant horizon, the white eagle flies once more. Ha, huh, Poland is not yet dead. Well, for now, maybe it is, but in the future, it won't be, hopefully. I know I've read that one through. That's my third time literally reading that, so. I do want to see if we can just keep getting more Reformation of the Party, because we will want to get that eventually. So, Reformers will have a 10% boost, but I want Reformation. So, the 25 one is probably the one we want to do. It's 25 and 50. Well, that's a lot of influence, not going to lie. A nation without our wealth, or without wealth. If the plans of the Social Slaver Party would be put into place now that the economy would almost certainly collapse under the strain of the debt the government would incur. However, the SLP remains keen on beginning their noble work of fighting poverty. They will have to, of course, temporarily postpone their plans to find a way to generate the wealth the country will need to afford the proposed increases in spending. Taxes have already been raised to cover for any potential shortfalls in spending, but a more long-term method of generating income is needed. Two methods have been proposed. Both rely on the opening of England's markets to bring foreign money, increasing the volume of the country's exports. The first harkens back to the days of industrial England of the 19th century. Of course, the same exploitative practices of unchecked capitalism will be avoided. Instead, the government will help build factories and protect the workers, thus taking many workers out of employment. The profits will be reinvested by the government on behalf of the workers, ensuring a fair trade for the labor. The second involves exploitation of England's natural resources, from coal to steel. Both these industries will be nationalized and maintained by the government to ensure maximum efficiency and rights of the miners and workers. Either way, England's economy will become more reliant on foreign consumers from the OFM, but the people would rather we dependent on them than the Germans. Yeah. I want to do this one, but this, it just makes more sense to do this one. It just makes more sense, because we get more industrial equipment. This stuff is nice, it's more fun. Factories in the cities. The majority of English factories aren't localized or located within the major metropolitan areas. And whilst this might make cities nice and livable, it also limits the number of people willing to work away from their homes. But we are not capitalists limited by a bourgeois concern such as a view over our cities. Our people need jobs and we'll give them just that. London, Manchester, Birmingham, and Newcastle can be expanded into first. After that, we can aim for York, Hull, and Liverpool. Eventually, every city in England will have its own independent industrial base, which is good because the amount of interest in cheap English goods is already rising. Very good. More fuel to the fire. No furnace will run without coal. And fortunately, England has a rather large amount of it. Not quite so much as neighboring Wales, but we can make do with what we have at the present time. My apologies about this, but I need to go ahead and get some more city stuff, shall we? Yes, we put shall. Our government will, well, God dang it, will ensure a direct route from the mines to the furnaces. We don't have many cl to close, many close buyers of coal in any case, since the Germans are not what one might call friendly. The jobs from this will endeavor, from this endeavor, will keep many a family fed. And what kind of socialists would we be if we deserted one of our major supporting groups during the Civil War? We have many friends amongst the Union veterans, and it's time we gave them their due. Absolutely. I'm still ignoring um. Could have done more industry stuff, whatever. We're doing actually we're doing pretty darn well here. I'm not gonna lie, we're doing pretty darn well. Nothing up there I really care about. Nothing here yet. Lots of reformists. God, you gotta smoke. What are your teeth, man? What are your teeth? Cool. And let's see. State of the English military. Could definitely be a lot better, but we'll obviously fight Wales first. And, well. Oh, there goes oh, Hadrian's butt. Oh, well, uh-oh. Well, oh, that's not good. We should do well against Wales. I'm not too worried about it. How much, do we need to keep political power at all? I'm not really sure. More fuel to the fire, please. Thank you very much. Followed up with the means of mass production. Oh, yes, please. Let's do that one first. Where once it was a job of the craftsmen to create artisanal works. Nowadays, we use more refined and efficient methods to make the objects of men's desires. Ooh, I like desires. Machines turning and grinding in vast clockwork formations which create England's salvation. Factories are more efficient than ever, and with a rudimentary computing technology, we can increase efficiency to levels not impossible once upon a time. The benefits of this mass production will be used to increase the standard of living for all of our people. For we'll not just be limited just by what we make for others, we can make goods for ourselves as well. Good. Alright, 100 Westminster Bridge Road. Harry Pollitt, 
Oh, was one of the bravest men that England ever knew, uh, continued Kim Philby. The crowd and press photographs who had gathered, and when they asked for his name for this office, I could think of no better person to honor. His sacrifice in the London uprising has paved the way for the liberation of England, and a brighter tomorrow was possible because of it. This structure would originally be helping the collaborationists maintain their police state, but today it would house important work. Work that must be done to keep us safe and ensure the rights of people everywhere not that are not trampled by their oppressors. And if Harry was here today, I'm certain he would be beaming with pride by what we have done and how he's remembered. Thank you. There was applause as Philby stepped into the Red Ribbon in front of a group of notables here for the dedication ceremony. The mayor of London was not among them. Eating cookies on the refreshment table, he had not expected Philby, expected Philby to be so brief. But he hurriedly ran back on stage, smiling to the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, he said with, as an aide handed him and Philby sets of scissors, I now declare the Pullet Building the new home of MI6. Open! Philby and the mayor cut the ribbon as camera flashes lit them up. While Philby was outwardly smiling, he was inwardly angry that the mayor had broken the number one rule about the structure, that this was officially a non script office structure for some unnamed agency, nothing more. And even if, even if everyone knows differently. Cool. And we're going to keep doing this one too? Or, um, a 32 and a half for efficiency, so. Mm, there we go. 32 and a half jumps up to 37 and a half. Nice. Just got to make sure the military is very loyal to us, that's all. Alright. The means of mass production. Yeah, we'll do a cup of coffee here to keep it nice and toasty. I'll keep some of my political power now. Because uh, we don't have that much. We might need it in the future, so. You never know. The Battle of Barcelona. What happened to Harold Wilson? I don't know why he's not here. Uh, do we need both? Requires one of the following. Uh, that's okay. We do get more construction speed faster. I'd prefer to do this workers in the factories. Factories need the people to work them, and neither money nor threats will fix that as the fascist collaborators all too often forgot. We, uh, the Socialist Labor Party, have a different and, dare we say, better solution. We'll simply pay the workers a wage worth of sweat. The Marxist dislike of factories, after all, has traditionally stemmed from the fact that they exploit the workers' efforts for more money than they contribute to the process and labor themselves. This will continue, unfortunately. As a capitalist, we'll fight anything else, but the least we can do is give our workers a fair share of the profits. Throw in some excellent benefits. And a factory position might not be so bad a job for the youth of today. Not bad. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, we can do more stuff here. But, nah, we're okay for now. I just want to save some of our PP for now, so. Alright, my friends. Export to the OFM. America's like a furnace. Into the maw of a great beast that goes, goes resources and materials like the likes of which tens of thousands Englands could never hope to consume. And out of the fires comes enough money to fund a reform six times over. The rest of the OFM are interested in their proposals as well. Not having to deal with a problem as an extinctive capitalist response, and if we build things cheaper, is that not merely the hand of the market in action? The facts of the matter are that we now have committed to our course we cannot falter. If we want to turn England into a paradise our children will enjoy, we must make some compromises here and now. Empty pockets won't fund schools or hospitals, but American money definitely will. We get more construction speed, which is great. I love it. Actually, get more resource speed, too, for export focus. Factory output, not too bad. We'll gladly take that, too. And the workshop of the free world. If something is made cheap... <clears throat> Uh, chances are it was made by an Englishman, or uh, if something is made, chances are it was made by an Englishman, and it's three times cheaper than what the American is trying to sell you. The recent years have been good for English business, and now we make what the rest of the world is growing ever hungrier for, be it toys, machines, or computers. We can design it, build it, and improve upon it. This has not been without sacrifice, of course. It is back-breaking work, and our people will need to be well compensated for any political or potential injuries incurred in the making of this economic miracle. But now that we've the needed funds, we can give them everything they have earned and more. The Socialist Labor Party can move forward with our true reforms. Nice. <clears throat> Even though we're going to sub get rid of these jobs just by a little bit, but that's okay. Alright. A little more efficiency. Yes, please. Yes, yes. We're not quite there. 90% is still pretty darn good, I'm not going to lie. That's pretty darn good. So after this, we're going to go ahead and do what? Keeping the workers fed. Hungry mouths make for a precious little work, and unfortunately, England has had to deal with a reality that we don't make quite enough to feed our current population. Importing food is expensive, and whilst we might never export in great quantities, again, there's no reason why the Wilson government cannot correct this fault. For the sake of the people, not for profit. Funds are always an issue, but the Socialist Labor Party is broadly on board with two potential options. We can invest significantly in conventional agriculture, which might not be so profitable, but it'd be nice for a public relations boost, and ingratiate us with the rural population. Or we could just say about upgrading and expanding our fishing fleet. It's not like the cod is ever going to run out after all. I don't know, with a mindset like that, you never know, man. You gotta protect the environment sometimes, yo. Buy some coffee. Well, actually, water first. Fund the farms. One, two, three. Or you get 2% more libertarian socialism. One, two, three. Um, subsidize or fund the farms? Oof. Subsidize the fisheries. I don't know. Mmm. I don't like the fisheries just because it seems like 
I don't know. It, it seems like you, you eventually run out if you're not careful, and we might be super careful here, but... <sighs> Subject is the fisheries. I don't know. I, mean, I kind of want... I think I'm going to go fund the farms, because we went to the lost side here. Let's go to the lost side here, too. I want to do this one just because, I don't know, farms seem a little slightly more... A little more su sustainable than oh, fisheries. I mean, it just depends on how well you take care of it. But, the heart of the English spirit has long been the yeoman farmer, who... They who till the land and bring forth the spoils for the people to feast, but the Industrial Revolution led to the abolition of many commons in English agriculture has been on the decline since the reign of Queen Victoria. Every government provides funds to expand the farms we have. We should be capable of producing enough food to keep the English people from being at risk of starving should a storm wreck the North Sea or the fisheries die. The grain, vegetables, and meat from these farms can be put to other uses as well. School provided lunches perhaps could be a start. Nice. Yeah, I don't know. As much as... I want to reward these guys for being, you know, part of the group here. Because not everyone here was, I think, part of our group when he rose up, but it is what it is. A caramel-colored wave. And a massive new shop in, or facility in Sidcup, South London. The first bottles are loaded onto trucks to go out all across London and Southern England. They're loaded onto shelves, and as soon as the doors open, they're gone. And uh, and the trucks go back to bring more out to the 13-acre population. Coca-Cola has not been available legitimately in England since the Second World War. Some bottles have been smuggled in through Scotland or Wales, but it was never available to, on a wider market. But with the end of the trade embargo between the U.S. and England, Coke is back, and it's back with a massive investment by the Atlantic Base Company. Atlanta based. Coke is undoubtedly pleased with a strong reception in London and has plans to open up bottling facilities in Leeds, Nottingham, and Petersburgh to cater to English demand. The carbonated beverage will soon be valuable, available in all corners of England, along with a new concoction the company is pushing called Sprite, teaching England to sing. That was one heck of a way. I did not expect this. I was, wow. We saw them all the way, literally just down the tips of southern Germany and Austria, but they came back and just beat the crap out of Goring. Holy shnikes. Wow, that is impressive. I mean, it's boring for us, because... Oh, there's GGR's back. Look at that lag. Oh. Just, Jesus Christ. But after funding the farms, accelerate the mechanization. One of the downsides of being isolated from the Empire as a whole and most of your major allies for near on three decades is the fact that you fall behind technologically somewhat. Doubly so when merely rebuilding what was bonded into smithereens is your primary problem. But the Socialist Labor Party was not elected to sit around and let the market fix things. A program to mechanize agriculture and fishing will go down with the farmers who need every penance of the harvest. The Americans who we purchase the machinery from will doubtlessly also be pleased with the gains. This will be an expensive exercise to say the least, yet the long-term gains from cheap labor or cheap food for our, for our people should not be understated. Cool, and we'll grab this one too. Because we can. Keep going, guys, keep going. The economy is looking pretty great. Start cutting down that debt, my friends. Cut, cut, cut. What do we do when your hair's too long? We cut, cut, cut. Oh, Takagi, hello, Takagi. Last speech. Well, okay, so let's zoom out. How far can we go? So we only have these two sides of the trees to do for now. Um, Let's change things around here. It's 20 day focus. A new model army. Lessons from the Civil War. Keeping the militias. The new Red Air Force. A Red Fleet. Um, I kind of do the OFM with us, but don't split the party. Let's do the Ch Ooh, England. Now that we've vanished or vanquished the old illegitimate collaborative government, we have claimed our rule as a true England. There are no more German boots or no capitalist chains to hold us down anymore. England has freed itself and is independent once more. We can at long last start on reforming the country and create a fair, more social society. Once this is achieved, we will stand tall. The world will see us and they will learn to respect us. You bet they will. Hmm. Very good. <sighs> I just hope Harold Wilson shows up. Because it seems like we have Harold Wilson, but not the real Harold Wilson. And there... Oh, two for one, huh? Two for one, eh? Oh, what is our Navy doing? Um, There you go. Just merge them all. Oh, look at that. Nice. It's, it's almost nothing, but... You know what? I'd rather have it than have nothing. Oh, you're actually... Yeah, I'll come back to Fraser. There you go. Do that, and D, D. Nice. Cool. Actually, do we have any planes before I forget what it's... Uh, it must be... Uh, see? Our guys are looking really bad. Look how bad this looks. Oh, it's still not good. Oh, it doesn't help that I'm cutting down military spending, but whatever. Oh, we have no more planes either. Okay, well, train then. A true England, the true England, the Commonwealth. Our imperialist past has left us with a lot of old ties with countries from across the world. Whilst many memories of our rule will be bitter, we hopefully will be able to show them what we have changed. We're no longer the murderous colonizer that we once were. England would much rather stand shoulder to shoulder with the Commonwealth than lord over them from above. A new age of relations will be hailed with all these nations. Such friendships will be necessary in keeping us strong and independent of the Germans.
Nice. Alright. Hey, not bad, not bad. Um, since we're here, we'll do it again, why not? Boom. More reformation, please. Reforms. The true England. I don't think, when I play as, like, the collaborationist, like, trying to get down the debt, or trying to get the debt lower than the GDP, took a while to do, I thought. I can't remember, honestly. We don't even lower, we barely lower by even a billion. Oh my goodness, so bad. Alright, cast off dead generations. We hereby announce to all free nations of the world that England now truly exists. The previous collaborator government in London was nothing but a collection of German puppets who ruthlessly slaughtered the English working class and funneled all of our hopes of a better life to the Germans. Those pretenders were merely leaders of another Reich's commissariat, not England. And we urge all defenders of liberty to recognize that in their dealings with us. Or, recognize that in their dealings with us. Cable from Peter Shore to the OFM. Comrades, we're finally building the first state truly worthy of claiming to work for all Englishmen, especially in the working class. Under your leadership, Cuba overthrew the reactionary regime that once slaughtered its working class. We look warmly at your successes so far and hope that in our joint efforts we can begin the long task of rebuilding global communism. Personal telegram received by Fidel Castro. Your lapdogs will never again oppress us. F you. Personal telegram from Peter Shore sent to the foreign office in Germania. We shall begin. We shall be a nightmare on the brains of the Germans. Fellow democracies. Despite the tyrannical right-wing way that has swept the world, some democracies have managed to survive. If we are to keep the light of democracy alive in our part of the world, we will have to reach out to these countries and ensure good relations. We must learn that we are not alone. From India to Sweden, there are there's still hope for the people who suffer in this world. Cool. One, two, almost three. Almost three all the way, my friends. Minus 132. Nice. Not bad. This guy is okay. Wow. Hmm. I definitely have better. Whew. One percent increase. Um. Five percent of former boost. The former boost doesn't matter. So. Cool. The old dominions. But let's go and click on this one first. Thank you, fellow democracies. The. <clears throat> Off order of a foreign minister, sure, official delegations have been sent to the governments of the former Commonwealth. The India, New Zealand, and Australian governments uh, received our diplomats warmly. Canada, however, did not appreciate our visit. As a prime refuge for monarchists, refuge in monarchists and anti-German aristocrats, its politics have grown to be quite conservative and anti-republican in comparison to the ones in England. Our commitment to socialism has also disturbed the Canadians, with American influence strongly pushing the country towards free market capitalism. And yet, for all their issues with our policies, they are still willing to cooperate. But we shouldn't expect friendship. That went quite well, all in all. Oh, Canada. Dealing with the exiles, the exiles are a truly sad story. Yet their skeptic Canada during the German invasion was daring and has made them considerably popular with some of our people. However, they are tainted by the corrupt capitalist path they took. Restoring them back to their old positions would be unimaginable given the new socialist direction the country has taken. Many in the more moderate wings of the party would like to allow them back into the country. Though they would lose much of the wealth and privilege that they, of course, left behind. Contrary to this, the hardliners would much rather they remain in exile, as they see their past as far too incompatible with the present reality. Wow, look at that. Then there is the question of the significant matter of what to do with the Queen, who has been the figurehead of the large part of Free England ever since before the start of the Civil War. The Free World, after establishing ties with our former subjects, the only logical course of action would be to go further, towards the other free nations of the world. That is why the Ministry of Foreign Aid, or Foreign Affairs, has spearheaded an outreach effort to all nations not bound by the shackles of fascism. The first and most important was a mission to the US of A. Our delegation, notably headed by Minister Shore himself, arrived in Washington and dined with the President in the White House. That must have been really good. Socialist ambassador from England meeting George Walsh in America. Negotiations were fruitful, supposedly, and we can expect greater economic aid and potential political backing in the near future. Other missions to Sweden and South America were sent, but considering the precarious situation in those countries, and in case of Sweden, an ever-looming threat of German invasion, aid and cooperation with them is predicted to be minimal. Could have gone better, could have gone worse. Oh, and Ireland is not having a good time. The socialists have risen up. Do we aid them? Can we, can we aid them? This looks like... The Alaskan flag or something. Twomey, huh? Wait. Wait. Irish Socialist Republic are allied to the Germans. Whoa. You guys screwed up hard then. Holy crap. Ah, uh, the Patriot Division. <sighs> Daddy George Wallace. Name new ambassadors. Having reinvigorated much of our old presence in the world, we'll have to maintain our contact with the outside world. To do this, we'll have to appoint po plenty of new, preferably socialist ambassadors to man the English embassies throughout the world. Our position will be reasserted, as we know that we'll have to rely on our international alliances to protect us from the beasts that plagued our lands. Not so long ago. Cool. Hey, that's getting better. Deaths is getting better, 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 better. One, two, three, and then some. 
an alliance of necessity. Today, official diplomatic cables were sent to Washington, where their diplomats will likely react with bewilderment or bewildered excitement as our socialist nation applies to join the OFM. We have no illusions about the OFM being progressive or a long-term ally of ours. This simply exemplifies a kind of ruthless pragmatism led and practiced as more than necessary given, our, given Europe's state of affairs. With the might of the Yanks on our side, Germany will never be able to trifle with us and we will have solid trade partners to boot. There's a slight possibility that they may refuse entry to a lodestar of the global left, but what other friends do these capitalist dudes have in the world? I wonder if we can push them left. Hey, you never know. Ah, uh, industry. Yeah, small industry. Extraction, even though I don't think we'll probably need that. Uh, yeah, not really. Even though military doesn't matter too much right now, but Citizen Elizabeth Windsor. We can now that the aristocratic menace to torment a country once again, in case you forget, comrades. It was the accursed Windsors that we overthrew the nobility, which welcomed the Germans to the Isles, yet... Yes. Citizen Elizabeth did not follow in the footsteps of her uncle, and the exiles oppose the occupation, but their class makes them complicit in the crimes against the proletariat. We must nationalize their assets, all of them, so that justice can finally be served to those exploiters of the working class. The arguments presented by one of the few notable remaining hardliners cause a storm in the party and the government itself. Many believe that in accordance with the theory of class conflict, there can be no reconciliation with the aristocracy. Some Wilsonites, however, thought over the wise and submitted a new offer to the government, nationalize most noble assets, but let Elizabeth Windsor and several other nobles keep some of their family's res residences, provided that they special pay special taxes. Elizabeth herself would be considered a special citizen and made into a potential propaganda asset. The age of nobility is over. But that doesn't mean we have to be cruel. We're going to be cruel. Because, why not? Of course, whenever this path, the, the actual Hardliner path gets content, I'll probably do the same thing, but I'm going to play Wilson twice. We'll see what happens. I don't know. I don't know what the devs are thinking at the time it's recording. I'm sure that some of them probably don't like me from what I've said in the past, but um, hey, hey, you never know. Always interested in seeing what the devs are up to. Or what they're cooking up. Hopefully not too many car bombs. Anyways. Um, besides, we have more than enough Hardliner influence anyways. We'll keep the, the queen in power when we play Jellico anyway, so... There you go. And we're back. Don't split the party, guys. Keeping the party united is already known to be one of the key factors that got us elected in the first place. Yet, we remain at the risk of dividing the party if we neglect the wishes of the more hardline among our government. In particular, we must remain particularly conscious of Reg Birch and Kim Philby, who have taken the lead of the communist factions within the party. However, Wilson will ultimately be made the strongest figure in our party, but whether he can maintain his mantle is yet to be assured. Well, I hope so. He hasn't shown up for work yet, so... But the NDL is illegal. Let's form a consensus first, probably. Unite the public. Oh, there'll be RF. Nice. Um, I want to. I will increase this once we lower the NDL. Form a consensus. Re Reginald Butch has long made his disdain for democracy clear to those around him. His view not one shared with the majority of the party, however. A clear consensus will have to be made to ensure that the party is united on this issue. This will let us make sure that their anti-democratic gang knows that their views are not shared with the rest of the party, nor the English people. Maybe then they will learn to keep their mouths shut about the more unpalatable convictions. Don't worry, we just got rid of the monarchy, so it doesn't matter. What are we at? 90% is still pretty awesome. 57%? That's not bad. Oh, wait, is it actually increasing? It's currently what? 52.5. The base efficiency is 57, so it's actually just keep going up. So now it's going to be 62.5. Nice. Very nice. Don't split the party, guys. Don't split it. The good old Leninists. <clears throat> Here, take a look at this, Alfred. Wilson nodded towards a manila floor lying on the table. A dossier on Birch. It contains everything there is to know about him, and everything we were able to gather anyway. Original Birch. Robin starts reading the dossier. Born on June 7th, 1914 in Kilburn, London. Activist of the Al Amalgamated Engineering Union. Republican supporter in the Spanish Civil War. Perfect socialist credentials. Had he stopped there, yes, but he didn't. Read the rest, please. Member of the Communist Party of the Great Britain from 1939 to its dissolution following the 1953 Lenin Uprising. There's the problem. As history shows, Leninists have a habit of purging more moderate elements from the parties. I know the dudes. They consider anyone less fanatical and radical than them revisionists. Indeed, considering his past beliefs and his present rhetoric, I'd say that he isn't the greatest fan of ours, and he doesn't want a liberal democracy. You know what that entails and why we can't let him get his way. The right, the fight against the collaborationists was too long and bloody let it to go all to waste. We have to get rid of him, talk to other party members, try to subtly sway their opinions against him. Don't involve anyone else. This must be resolved here in the SLP. I'll try my best. And I want to go through this first, maybe? And then do this later on, because we do need to do this before the elections happen again. But happy 1966, everybody. Uh, let's do a form of consensus. I actually might want to go down here. The OFN with us. 
From a purely Eurocentric point of view, one might believe we are doomed without and without friends. Certainly, we are one of the few isolated countries in Europe that is democratic, as well as the only one that has a government that supports the rights of the working class and the struggle for liberation. But one need only pull back to see that we have the best friends in the world. Our former dominions in Canada and Australasia. Our colonies in the Mediterranean. And of course, the incalculable might of the United States. Oh, our good little child. Take that into account and the world look, just looks a little bit brighter. Nice. Oh, there goes those guys. Oh no, Poland might be lost. We got some more done. Um, once we get through all these, what are we here at for? Oh, minus three, almost 400. Very nice. Our GDP now is greater than our debt. That's awesome. Now, it's not growing as much as we'd like, but, you know, beggars can't be choosers. The United Front. To an unknowing observer, the small, secluded cottage was just another one of the many kind standing right outside of London. To Wilson's loyalists. It was a safe meeting place, far away from the prying eyes and eyes and ears of spies and traitors. To England, it would be the founding set of a front which would decide its future. Welcome, comrades. I've invited you here to discuss the threat most dire, one with the potential to destroy all that we've been working for these past 15 years. You know me, comrades. I have no qualms about cooperating with people of beliefs other than mine, if it serves England well. I believe that the war against the collaborators proved this to anyone still in doubt. Our victory was a shared one. Socialists, liberals, communists, conservatives fighting and dying side by side so that England might be free. I'm proud of this, proud of the fact that we place our country's interests before the interests of the party. Now, however, it seems that their cooperation with certain elements has gone too far. Some of you might already know who I'm talking about. Reginald Birch, the Leninist snake. As much as I wanted to believe in socialist unity against the exploiters of the world, recent developments show that it is not possible. Birch is out for us, comrades, who cares not about the democracy and liberty we have fought for, only for his ambition and twisted vision of the future. Once he gets rid of us, one way or another, he shall rule with an iron fist, branding anyone opposed to him a reactionary. History has shown us through Lenin's example. Now I ask this of you, comrades. Will you let this happen? A thundering no shook the entire cottage. March on in. March on in the United Front against tyranny. Ties with Canada. The capitalists can help. Ties with the Pacific nations. Oh, we lose cores? <gasps> no! <laughs> Increase all socialist nations' opinion. The capitalists can help. America isn't exactly our natural ally. Any nation that's willing to deploy its troops to guarantee the capitalists a hefty return isn't really a nation that we could think to be an ally of the revolution, especially when a decent number of their politicians despise us. However, we do share a tremendous hatred of the Germans, and even the bourgeois democracies of the world do not wish to live as slaves, us. The special relationship endures for us still. Let us start seeing how we can cooperate on certain things beneficial to us both. Very good. Actually, we have no tanks, so there's no point in doing that yet. Let's keep focusing on this stuff. Very nice. Hmm. Sad day. Out of coffee now. Independent member, huh? And OFM. Nice, look at that. We're blue. I forget exactly when we go to war with Wales and Scotland. It'll happen eventually, but I don't exactly remember. It's weird. We don't get that anything for social development yet. This feels very weird. Like, nothing even for poverty... Yep, there goes Free Indonesia. Goodbye, Free Indonesia. Alright, anything here? Um, we'll just keep increasing this up for now. There you go. I want it pretty high. So, uh, boots on the ground. The sure certainty against German invasion is to ensure that we have enough forces to repel an invasion, or better yet, make them scared of us mounting one of our own. Now we could simply give every man, woman, and child an Enfield and prepare them for another sea line. Or we could just allow the Americans to come in and get the same result for a lot less time and money. The choice is clear. We will call Washington and ask if they would be interested in basing troops here. And we almost certainly know what the answer would be. Oh, we get more infantry equipment. With a free world, return to duty. Planes in the air. So hard to cool the stuff. Oh, which one? I mean, either one. It doesn't really seem like it hurts us at all, so. House of Lords Act. I'm not really sure which one I want to do. Let's see. Let's do planes in the air. America is one of the largest air forces in the world. Massive strategic bombers and nimble jet fighters. Tactical. Oh, there, there you go. Uh, close tactical, close air support, and interceptors, transports, and tankers, and in the event of war, they will all be stationed in an area that is not ready for them. Our airfields will be expanded, new hangars constructed, new runways built, for new fuel tanks provided. We must be ready for the potential of war, and that means ensuring that allies have plenty of options to do what they must. Bombing England. Ah, the second African war. Not bad. Africa shield. Huh? Oh, they lost some places over here, too. And right here. Sucks to be you guys. Hmm, no focus on. That sucks. Alright, all this stuff is done. Great, let's keep going to this stuff. Proof anti-tank is be nice. 
followed up with Canada, Tides of Canada. We may not have given Canada entirely what they wanted. The people of England chose to forge a new path, one that forgoes all ties to the British Empire of old, and certainly, there are those who reside in Canada who wish another government was in power, but there's no reason why our new path should fly in the face of friendly relations. Canada speaks English. They have many people of English heritage there, and we share the same heroes for the most part. So why not focus on what binds us together? Nothing prevents us from working together with such a similar nation in culture and constitution. Russia's gearing up to be one heck of a really black hole for everyone. Which is awesome. Divine Mandate, the Central Siberian Federation, Omsk basically in WRF. It's going to be so extremely bloody over there. Holy crap. Uh, actually, 95. We do this one more time. Uh, 95%. Great. Our international brotherhood. A successful socialist revolution has two responsibilities. First, to support the development of true socialism in their own country. Second, to ensure that the peoples of the world can achieve liberation in theirs. We should let the world know that a leftist revolution can succeed even in a place as authoritarian and reactionary as post-war England. We will not skirt our international duties either. The workers' states of the world will be aided by us and our bonds will grow stronger. Together, we will bring glory to the revolution and ensure a world free of want and deprivation. Repatriation of the English so we no longer lose stability but we no longer get more monthly population which sucks but hey, it's okay. Wait, our weekly change is going up by 0.2. Ooh, new ambassadors, thank you. We encourage that type of behavior here. Church, fixing the counties. Cool. Ah, there goes Kazakhstan, ties with the Pacific Nations. Australia and New Zealand were content to renounce any ties with us after the war, and who could blame them? The two disastrous wars and the collapse of the UK. Anyone would want to get out of the British Empire in those situations. But now we must reconnect with them for a common good. To start a new relationship. One not based on the colonial master and slave model, but one based on respect in our shared culture and values. Very good. Ah, uh, since we're here, we need to 25, why not? Reformation is coming along very nicely. And they're very loyal as well. What is this? New ambassadors? Ah, oh, it's very good. I love the new ambassador stuff. Very nice. Ah, oh, more land attack. Nice, minus 800 billion. That's looking a lot better than it was earlier. Very good. The cry for liberation. The man stepping up to the podium within which the delegates of the Communist Workers' Conference was seated in front of was well known to many. The British section of the international struggle against fascism had long been lauded for the bravery, even in the aftermath of the failed London uprising. Yet, with the defeat of the traitors, English collaborators saw a new face that had become the symbol of England over the workers of the world. Bill Alexander waited for the right for, for the light, smattering of applause that is rising to die down before he spoke, the room listening intently. Comrades, workers, friends, long have we struggled against the menace of fascism in the world. We, the people who knew its poison well, its venom that it seeks with even now to end the freedoms of the working class. I fought it in Spain, Russia, and even my own home of England, but... Thanks to our combined efforts, we shall now show more than pleas and promises. Thanks to the efforts of the members of this forum, England has been liberated. A rush of cheering erupted at the words, even the otherwise stoic Cuban delegation politely clapping along. The speech continued for some time, but it was the ending that most caught the attention of the reporters. And so I beg my leave, I have but this to say, as your people bled for us in the fields of England, so too shall this newly established revolutionary commonwealth aid you in your own struggle for liberation. The workers of the world unite. For those opposed to fascism, it was a pleasing ending to a great speech. For those opposed to communism, it seemed almost like an eerie promise. A red rising and renouncing our imperialist past. It appears that some of our old colonialist claims have caused a rift between us and the U.S. The previous English government claimed the Isles of St. Helena and Ascension Island and contested American ownership of them. Now, most regard this as an unenforceable act of pettiness and left it off. However, to our surprise, we have never actually rescinded these claims. Now, these islands were once good for disposing of would-be world conquerors, but right now they wouldn't be of much use even if we did have them. We shall cease our colonialist legacy and improve relations with America at a single stroke. And we like stroking here. And with the free world. Whenever the despot wishes to impose a rule upon a population, wherever justice and the rule of law are nowhere to be found, whoever is under the threat of tyranny and the majority, and whatever the threat to the liberties of man is, you will find free peoples willing to stand up to the slave world, and at the forefront is the Commonwealth of England. Very nice. And it's positive. Nice. Uh, we don't need to do the other, other military high command stuff because we have to work with that with a little bit. I think from here on out we're going to do a little more reformation stuff too. That's some 57 billion so far. Let's see, minimum annual debt payment is 3.01 billion. That's not bad. Nice. Almost a billion gone. Great, another one done. 
um, let's change things around here. It is already widely known that large parts of English society are incredibly backwards faced and corrupted by years of fascist rule and the threat of German occupation. However, we have helped since free our people from the dangers of German influence. Now is the time for us to make a difference and fix England to better fit our model vision for the future. We will remove all of the scars left over from the rule of the traitors and change the country for the better. Cool. Hmm. Even more, I guess. Yeah, why not? Cool. Some radical appeal. Return to duty. Chester Nicholson. Didn't know what to expect when he got off the jet at Heathrow. London certainly looked better than when he remembered it, although the last time he saw it, it was on fire. That had been the last time he saw the city, and was certainly his most vivid memory of the war. A sniper had gotten him outside a slough a week later, and he was shuffled through the collapsing medical bureaucracy until he found himself doing rehab in a New York hospital when the war was over. He always intended to go back, and he told his wife that much when they were married. Or when they married. But now, with England free, he actually could. Before, he could only see England through a zoomed-in camera lens from the Scottish border on ABC. Now, he just showed proof of his military service with the 42nd Infantry Division to his consulate, and they gave him permanent residency for his family. As the Nicholsons drove up to Burnley, Chester reflected on what had become his country. News reports of the recently liberated England showed him a nation in ruins, the crumbling of an empire with rampant poverty and social problems. But now that he was here, he could see that that was not true. There was massive wreckage and devastation and the rampant poverty. But the people weren't as miserable in the news reports. They looked happier and healthier and somehow. Perhaps England will be a better nation with people like this living in it. A mere sense of community works wonders. Nice. Moderation were necessary. The fervor for reform has started to grip the party, and many have started to call for us to go further than ever before. To introduce changes so radical that they would likely cause much more harm than the good, we must be minted. To, we must minted. We minted to introduce. It would be best for us not to go overboard with the reforms. Some of the changes that we would introduce will be unprecedented, but they will be crucial to improving society. Embracing radicalism would only lead to our downfall. Therefore, it is the best to be best to avoid that. Cool. Seven days left. Not bad. Not bad. What else can we do here? Can you twenty-five PP? Yes, please. And efficiency. Even more efficiency. 82.5, and we'll be at 95 soon. Not bad. All before 1967. Moderation were necessary. We'll do the military stuff probably in the next episode, maybe. Uh, the spanner at work. Greater restrictions on the activities of the hardliners will have to be introduced in order to maintain our image of unity. All of the ministers associated with Birch will be barred from talking to the press and holding ministerial office. They may not be happy with these changes, but they will be necessary. We shall tighten the bolts that hold the hardliners down. If we were to get out of the place, it would likely spell disaster for our party. Oh boy. Less than a billion a year. Wow. That is not bad, everyone. Not bad. One, two, three, four, and then some. Nice. Well, that's case, just going to start building stuff up all around here. And then... Focus on these guys first. There you go. Night yeah, vision. Good, good, good arenos. And you're up at uh, 82, so we got a little bit more to do there first. Uh-oh. The spanner at work. Talk with moderate unions? Sure. Fortunately for us, the majority of the unions in the country share the moderate views held by the Prime Minister and most of the Socialist Labour Party. These unions in particular have already proved themselves invaluable in popularizing the party. They will have to be, they will have to be kept happy if they are to continue to help us into the future. We will arrange to meet with the leaders of these unions and remind them of the closeness of our causes among or along with a need to maintain socialist unity. Sounds pretty good. One, two, three, four. Oh, another one nice. Oh, again. Nice, 56 and a half. Almost. Almost 56 and a half. Very nice. This is, like I said, it's very weird. We're not even trying to help poverty. Oh, I mean, it's going up barely, but just, it doesn't feel like it's enough. It's just really not enough. So now we're at 90, oh, 87 and a half. That's pretty good. That is pretty darn good, not gonna lie. Yeah, I remember when playing as, like, was it Macmillan or something like this? Even these guys had some sort of, sh sort of social reformers there, but it's creating their hardliners. Carmads, you are the only ex-intelligence operatives in the party which I can trust. The rest, it seems, are on Birch and Philby's payroll. This is why I want you to execute this operation. What I need you to do is infiltrate the hardliners, gain their trust, and draft in-depth dossiers on them, focusing on the weaknesses and potentially embarrassing information. Forward any data you acquired directly to me and, and, and no one else. I fear that our wing of the party has already been compromised by hardliner sympathizers. Any questions? That's what I like to hear. Now get to work. England is counting on you. 
convince the hardliners. Word has reached us that some members of the hardliners seek to uphold democracy in spite of their leaders' views on it. This is good for the moderates among the party for two reasons. The first is that it means we may have more support than we first anticipated from this faction. The second is the fact that the hardliners are not all one of the mind, or not all of one mind, thus enabling us to play on their divisions and keep them out of power. Some of the more ardent communist MPs will need more convincing, but there is still a chance that most would rather stand with democracy than with Birch. Very, very nice. So let me know in the comments below, guys. I was kind of hoping that we I would get your opinion on this. Should we do the House of Lords Act? I should probably do this one and both of these. But should we do the Female Pension Act? Or should we do equality? Do we like giving women pensions? Or do they want equality? Let me know in the comments below which one do you think that we should do. And the one that gets most votes will probably be the one that we select for uh, this campaign. And let us conclude with bringing in Social Democrats. The Social Democrats are a modest yet influential part of the Socialist Labor Party. The group is composed of ministers who tend to be on the political right of the party, many of whom prefer to look back upon the ideals of old labor than embrace the more radical approach of the rest of the party's advanced. Their numbers may be small, but their support will be welcome. We need all the votes we can get from our own party. A promise to, of restraint will help the Social Democrats lend theirs. But if you enjoyed today's episode, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below. I hope tomorrow Harold Wilson actually does show up but I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous, tremendous rest of your time.